The Charleston County Public Library is the place to go for readers. We have more than 1.6 million books in our collection, plus the ebook and audiobook versions. Go to ccpl.org or follow us on social media to learn more. The Friends of the Library is a nonprofit organization that supports and enhances the programs and initiatives of the Charleston County Public Library through gifts of time and money. Visit charlestonlibraryfriends.org to become a friend and for more information. A lot of Welcome marginalized voices have been muted in traditional publishing. And a lot of us, especially women of color, trans authors, we're saying if you won't give us a seat at your table, then we'll make our own. And that's what self-publishing has done for a lot of us. Welcome to the final event in the 2021 Black Ink Book Festival. My name is Susan Hoffius, and I'm the president of the Charleston Friends of the Library, the host of this festival. Before I introduce our MC, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Kwame Mbalia, I want to take a moment to thank our partners, sponsors, and the amazing team that has made this festival possible. First, thank you to our 2021 Black Ink Committee, all of whom are volunteers, including Dewana Brockington, our chair, Melanie Collins, Savannah Frierson, Claire Fund, Natalie Hauf, Georgette Mayo, and Paul Stoney. While the Charleston Friends of the Library is the host of this festival, everything the Friends does, we do with and for the Charleston County Public Library. Thank you to the leadership of CCPL again for being all in on Black Ink. I wanna give a very special thanks to Natalie Hauf, Deputy Director of Innovation at CCPL, who with her team, including Sam Tyson, have worked tirelessly on everything from marketing to conference management. Thank you, Natalie and CCPL. The Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture at the College of Charleston is another multi-year partner of Black Inc. If you have loved the programming of this festival, most of the credit goes to Savannah Frierson. Savannah works at the Avery Research Center and has served on the Black Inc. Committee for the last couple of years. She and her programming committee members, Georgette Mayo and Ruth Rambo, have put together an outstanding schedule of events with dynamic and engaged participants. Thank you, Savannah and the Avery Research Center. Kindle Direct Publishing is a partner, a blacking partner of this event, and in case you missed it, presented a panel on Thursday about publishing in the KDP universe. Mm -hmm. Trisha Gallagher and KDP for their continued support. Live 5 WCSC partnered with Black Ink for the first time this year as a media partner. Their help getting out the word through PSAs is gratefully appreciated. Rotary of Charleston, YMCA of Greater Charleston, and the International African American Museum are Black Ink Associates. Arcadia, History Press, Evening Post Books, EBSCO, Synovus Bank, and Turning Page Bookshop are Black Ink supporters, and we thank them for their generous support. Our partners are all recognized in the arena and some have booths in the lounge. So please take a moment to visit their pages and show your love for the organizations and businesses that have made this festival possible. Finally, a huge shout out to Leah Ryan, our conference manager, the woman behind the curtain who's wrangled our conference platform and made sure that each session went as smoothly as possible. Thank you for your patience with this long list of thank yous. 
But truly, this conference was the product of many people who deserve to be recognized for their hard work to present this amazing event. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn it over to our MC and Chair, Dwana Brockington, and she will introduce our keynote speaker, Kwame Mbalia. Thank you, Susan. So first, let me start with saying good afternoon and thanking you all again for joining us for the fifth Black Ink Charleston African American Book Festival. In a year which has proven to be challenging for so many in our communities, our cities, our states, this nation, and other countries around the world, I heard about a book by Kwame Mbalia entitled Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. And it was exactly what was needed. Black voices were being raised around the country addressing social injustice and inequality. The world began clamoring for Black stories, and the Black Ink Festival was uniquely poised to amplify these voices. We didn't have to get ready to jump into the fray because we had been doing the work for five years. Full disclosure, I was a little late to the party because I'm not the target demographic. Technically, I'm a smidge past the middle grade leader years. Regardless, as soon as I became aware of its existence, I ran out and bought the book. I wanted to see for myself what all the hoopla was about, and it happened to be one of the best things that I did in a year that shall not be named. You see, my youngest nephew is eight, and he and I have had these countless conversations about superheroes. We talk about what makes a great superhero. Liam believes that they have to have secret identities that they hide from their parents. Um, and what would be the best superpower to have? No resolution on that one, um, but these days for me, it would be napping. <laughs> and because of these conversations with Liam, I came to the realization that there are not a lot of books out there for young black males that show them as the heroes, that have them saving the world, or that show them flexing their superpowers. Enter Kwame Mbalia and his iconic character, Tristan Strong. Tristan Strong is a young African-American boy who has had a traumatic experience and is dealing with his grief and loss. He ends up at his grandparents' farm for the summer and due to a hilarious encounter with an unforgettable character, he soon finds himself in a world where African-American folk tales and West African gods exist. I'd tell you more, but that would take the fun out of you reading this book for yourself. Here's what I can tell you about Mr. Mbalia. He's a husband, father, writer, a New York Times bestselling author, and a former pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical metrologist in that order. And look up metrologist. I had to. You'll be fascinated. His books, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky and Tristan Strong De Destroys the World, are published by Rick Warden Presents slash Disney Hyperion. He is a Howard University graduate and a Midwesterner living in North Carolina. His parents exposed him to West African and African American folk tales at an early age, and his mother is also a writer. His favorite writing space is a tent in his backyard, when it hasn't been commandeered by his little ones. Cheez-Its and dad jokes are his jam. And he has a weekly newsletter, Black by Popular Demand, that highlights traditionally published and indie Black authors and new releases. He also includes links so that you can purchase their, their books. He agrees with me that Gum Baby should have her own merchandise, and I'm going to keep rooting for that until it happens. His Twitter account is very much alive and well, and I dare say very entertaining. When asked in an interview with the Brown Bookshelf about what is still needed in books centering on Black people and Black experience, he said, and I quote, laughter, love, friendship, healing, growth. This isn't to say that books with these ideas don't exist, but I am saying that we need more of them and we need them highlighted and showcased, end quote. And with that, I present our keynote speaker for Black Ink 2021, Mr. Kwame Mbalia. How y'all doing? Um, I am overwhelmed by that introduction. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I would never have dreamed that I would be 
doing something like this, you know, three or four or even five years ago. Um, I just wanted to write. I just wanted to write stories. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as has been previously mentioned on multiple occasions, but I have to say it now. My name is Kwame Mbalia, and I am the author of the Tristan Strong series. Um, I am also the co-author, um, along with uh, Prince Yoel McConan, of the middle grade Afrofuturist sci-fi Last Gate of the Emperor, which will be coming out this May with Scholastic Books. And I am also the editor and a contributor of Black Boy Joy, a middle grade anthology that will come out this August with Delacorte Books, which is focused on the joys of Black boyhood. And that is the first time I think I've ever said that sentence aloud with the books that I have written and contributed to. And it is absolutely mind boggling. Again, like I said before, I just wanted to write stories and to know that um, these stories are appreciated and valued and are being consumed globally has been, um, it's been overwhelming. I, I, I cry on many a night because it is fantastic. Um, a huge thanks to the Charleston Friends of the Library and the Black Ink staff and coordinators for inviting me to keynote this event. Um, I am I'm gonna attempt to organize my thoughts for this in a you know in a relatively new manner um, to me. So so either this will go really, really well and you all will be talking about it for weeks, or it will go down in roaring flames and a spectacular failure, and you all will be talking about it for weeks. Either way, you win. Um, but how I chose to approach this keynote, this conversation uh, for, about, and with Black writers uh, had to be different. It did. Um, it had to stem from uh, a, a place of compassion, a place of empathy, and a place of love, because I am passionate about not only writing Black stories, but about uplifting um, Black writers and you know, aspiring writers and accomplished writers. And talking to these people, uh, to my people, to my writers, and to my kinfolk, whom I love. And is there a better way, I challenge you, I challenge you, is there a better way to begin talking to someone you love, to approach them, right? To convey your passion for them, uh, your support, your encouragement. Is there a better way to do so than by making them a playlist? I don't think so. I don't think so. So here it is. This introduction was technically track one, the opening track, the intro, and Kwame Mbalia's 10 track playlist to writing beyond. Uh, so when I say writing beyond, what, what do I mean? Well, this playlist hopefully will explain all facets of what we are trying to write beyond, whether it's the moment, whether it's the now, whether it's the then, whether it's ourselves. Um, so track two is writing beyond the moment. What does it mean to write beyond the moment, to write beyond the now? Well, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of obvious. Like, have you seen the world today? Have you seen the world today? Have you? How are we interacting at this very moment, virtually, not in person? I mean, although I must say this has been a wonderful experience and many thanks to the tireless efforts of everyone behind the scenes that have pulled this off, but we're not in person. This is the moment we're in right now. Um, we see what's on the news. We see what's happening throughout the country, throughout the world. Sometimes, as writers, sometimes as black writers, we have a higher escape velocity, right? We have a higher escape velocity our minds have to reach if we're going to leave the gravitational influence of the forces working against us right now. Did you like that term, right? My daughter wants to go into space, so I gotta throw that in there. Uh, escape velocity, meaning how much, how fast we have to go in order to escape the gravitational forces working against us. If that metaphor doesn't suit you, if it doesn't float your boat, I also thought about using 
the metaphor of activation energy. I'm a scientist, I'm a former scientist, but I will always be a scientist. And I thought about activation energy, which is what is required for atoms or molecules to undergo transformation or physical transport. Activation energy, what do we need to transform ourselves or to physically move ourselves in spaces that have been traditionally close to us? Activation energy. So how do we escape these forces raised against us? How do we attain this energy to transform thought and deed and scrolling feeds into words? It's easy. Well, it's not easy. It'll take a village. Communities have always shared burdens, and this is no different. Finding your people, i.e. those writers who share your drive, who match your energy, who are reaching for the sky right beside you, that's critical. And yet, and yet, you have a head start right here with Black Ink. The writers and contributors here at Black Ink attended this festival for the same reason as you, community, a community of writers. So reach out. Listen, I, I was in, you know what I'm saying, the air and meat space, right? I saw those tables that you could sit out, the social lounge that you could sit at. Sit down, reach out, start a conversation, and then, start a transformation. That's track two. I hope y'all like this playlist, man. I really do. Uh, track three, the then, writing beyond the then. What is the then? Uh, that's, that's easy. We talk about it all the time. That is the quote unquote canon. The literature ordained as gospel and taught religiously. Literature astonishingly monochromatic and gender exclusive exclusive, not inclusive. We talk about the classics, the bastions, the hallowed. By the way, if you cannot read the words, because you can't, they're on my screen, and if you can, we're gonna have words after this conversation. If you cannot read these words I'm speaking, you should note that there should be question marks after those accolades, those accolades or at least an asterisk when we talk about the classics, the bastions, and the hallowed. But how do we write beyond the literature of then? Again, we do so, again, as a community, by challenging the systems that say that these are essential and replying, essential to who? Or, you know, if you're an English teacher, to whom? I'm not sure which one of those fits right there, but either way, you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Um, as a community, we must challenge the system, and as individuals, we must challenge ourselves. I'm currently reading a book called uh, Craft in the New World. Um, and I wanted to uh, read a section. It's like a paragraph of something that I've underlined, highlighted, and uh, might even uh, photocopy and tape onto my dresser, all right? Um, and it goes, writers of color in a workshop where the craft values are implicitly white, or LGBT writers in a workshop where the craft values are straight and cis, or women writers in a workshop where the craft values are patriarchal and so on, are regularly told to know the rules before they can break them. They are rarely told that these rules are more than just craft or pure craft, that rules are always cultural. The spread of craft starts to feel and then work like colonialism. Recognize how you've internalized the then and then begin to dismantle it internally and externally with community. That was track three. And track four, I gotta break it up a little bit. This is my interlude. So for track four, the track four interlude, we have a reading from Tristan Strong, Punches a Hole in the Sky. This is the reading that I always perform for um, my school visits uh, because I like to show the range of characters to, these, to, to the, the, the readers, the young readers, the students, to get them excited about the story. I mean, this is a, it's a hefty book and it's for eight and up. And I want them to be enthused that what they hear now will carry them throughout the book um, and get them excited about not only reading this one, but also potential books, more books in the future. And this infamous scene is called the Gumbaby Break-In Scene. 
In the Anansi tales, Gum Baby was a doll Anansi used to trap an African fairy while he was on a quest. But in the story, the doll remained silent and wore leaves for clothes. This one, on the other hand, had on a black turtleneck and black pants, and her tiny feet were bare. And what were those stains she was tracking across the floor? <coughs> is talking to you, big boy. The doll marched across the floor, the serious expression on her face, ruined by the plopping sound each of her footsteps made. Don't make Gumbaby climb up there. Plop, plop, plop. Is Gumbaby talking to a brick wall? Plop, plop, plop. Oh, you're asking for it now. Plop, plop, plop. She was up the side of the bed and leaving dark stains on the blankets by the time I finally shook myself out of the daze and extended the flashlight like a weapon. Who, who are you? I whispered. The 10 inch doll glared at me, climbed atop my foot and struck a pose. Both chubby arms spread wide, one foot planted on my big toe. She laughed in her tiny voice. Ha ha ha! You wanna know who Gum Baby is? Gum Baby is the reason you sleep with the door locked. Gum Baby is the reason the sun runs away across the sky. Gum Baby is your nightmare, and people whisper her name and tremble around the world. <laughs> Shh, I said, waving my arms in warning. You're going to wake up my grandparents. Gum Baby cocked her head and looked at me as if I had just slapped her. Did you? She began. Did you just shush, Gum Baby? Didn't you hear the introduction? Being a nightmare and all that, and you locking your door? Did that not make sense? No, no, it made sense. It's just, should Gum Baby clarify? No, 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 it's fine. I just don't want, oh, good, good. In that case, Gum Baby will go upside your head if you ever think about shushing her again. Gum Baby scrambled across my lap and flailed at my chest with both sticky hands. Let another shush come out of their mouth. Let it. It'll be the last shush. Your shush maker will shushify. From Tristan Strong punches a hole in the sky. But enough of the interlude. We got to get back to the playlist, right? Uh, that was track four. Track five. Track five is all about writing beyond advice. The writing arena is littered with advice. Like, you can't take two steps without stumbling over it. And some of it will be useful or informative, or even inspiring. Advice about established genre norms or word counts or point of view, maybe narrative structure. Uh, and look, this advice will be helpful. Uh, it'll also be intimidating because you'll get advice from other authors, maybe advice from a keynote, sp a keynote speaker who, who, who struggles to practice what he preaches from time to time. You'll get advice from readers from agents, from editors, from marketing, from the internet, from Twitter, from craft books you collect like bad decisions on a Saturday night. You'll get advice from everywhere. And all of that advice is good until it isn't. And you have to write beyond it. Because at the end of the day, you will have to write the story that calls to you to be written. If it exceeds the expected word count of an opening chapter, or uses three different POVs, and one of them happens to be a secondary viewpoint, which, parentheses, by the way, that novel that I'm referring to in question is the fifth season of fantasy book by N.K. Jemisin, which went on to win the Hugo Award for Best Science Fiction or Fantasy Novel, and whose second and third novel in that trilogy also went on to win the Hugo Award in following years, making her the first author, a Black woman, the first author to receive that honor in such a fashion? In parentheses, if that's the story that calls out to you to be written, then you will have to write beyond all of that aforementioned advice. It is easy to collect advice, build a comfortable house of cards to shelter yourself in made of advice. But when that story calls to you to be written and it demands that that shelter come tumbling down, and that advice discarded like a bad hand, you're gonna have to make a choice. You can either A, force, force, 
force that story into the constraints of someone else's expectations, or you can write beyond. And you already know what I want you to do. So that was track five. We are half, we are halfway through, really halfway through? Am I speaking too fast? Let me enunciate. Track six, writing beyond ourselves. I'm glad that I had that metaphor of, of the advice house of cards that we build around ourselves um, uh, in the previous, in track five, because uh, track six and the Kwame and Bali, a 10 track playlist of writing beyond is writing beyond ourselves. Because that, in my opinion, we are the biggest obstacle we will face as writers. Sure, there will be gatekeepers, guardians of the doors of the literary establishment. And again, they will reference hallowed traditions, hallowed traditions as a means of exclusion or inclusion via special categories that by their very existence still classify you, me, us as other. So those folks will always exist. But before our stories get to them, they must first get through us. They must get through our doubts and our fears, through our stubborn insistence that what we've written or will write or have been thinking and dreaming and planning to write is not and probably never will be good enough. We measure the messy, chaotic potential held within our unwritten stories against someone else's polished and carefully packaged by hundreds of hands, final product, and then unsurprisingly, we say, see, 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 I knew it, when we inevitably come up short. We are the first gatekeeper our writing will ever encounter. The first, the first gatekeeper that our writing will ever encounter, the self-rejection. And if I can leave one lasting mark on the literary world, it will be a towering, blazing inferno where each and every one of us have dumped our self-rejection and lit that thing on fire, a pyre to putting ourselves down. It is 2021 and we are writing beyond our own self-imposed limitations. Let it be done. That's track six. Track seven, we got another interlude. And in this interlude, I am going to read from Tristan Strong Destroys the World. Um, and this one, this one is special to me uh, because it's something I wrote. And as an excerpt, I feel like it is something that I will continue to write over and over or that we will experience over and over. And finally, I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to get it out there. So I'm going to read this. It also has one of my favorite characters, which is Nana. I love Nana. I will always have a Nana character in every book that I write because grandmothers are special. I truly believe that. The table creaked, and when I opened my eyes, Nana sat across from me, concern on her face. You got something you need to talk about, she asked. I hesitated. What could I say? The magical world that I'd brought to the brink of disaster and then saved might be in trouble again, and I felt powerless to help? Tristan? I took a deep breath. I... I've been having bad dreams, Nana, really bad, about something that happened before and I guess I'm scared it might happen again. That wasn't exactly a lie, a generalization maybe, but it was still true. Nana nodded. You wanna tell me what your nightmare is about? I opened my mouth, then closed it, and she patted my hand. It's all right. You don't have to if you don't want to, but talking about it with someone might help. Isn't that what your, what your therapist back north said? I nodded. Mr. Richardson. Yeah, I mean, yes. He said to talk about it slowly or in pieces if I wasn't ready to talk about the whole thing. Exactly. Because it sounds like you've gone through some trauma. 
Trauma? Nana squeezed my hand, then got up to check the rolls in the oven. Yes, baby, trauma. A rough patch in your life, something that deeply distressed you. Can be physical or emotional or a combination of the two. She pinched off a piece of dough, rolled it between her hands until it was really long and thin, then laid it on the flower covered table. See, this is how your life normally looks. Well, something traumatic can do this. She smooshed a portion of the dough snake in the middle with her thumb so it was flat. Or it can do this. She pulled a different section into a sharp spike. And part of what makes trauma so difficult is the period afterward. Figuring out why you're hurting and how you can heal. There's no easy solution, baby. But at some point, you might have to talk about it, even if it's to yourself, especially if it's to yourself. Sometimes we can be our own worst obstacles to heal it. Understand? I studied the doe snake and nodded slowly. Sometimes I felt like that squash part, as if the weight of the world, of two worlds, were pressing down on me. And other times I'm more like that spike. Nana, I said slowly, can a whole bunch of people experience trauma at the same time? A sad smile crossed her face. Of course, baby. Sometimes an evil will rock a community, strip their will and feeling right from them until they're raw and bleeding and hurting, inside and out. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Ferguson. Oh yes, baby. A whole city can hurt at once. And how does a city like that, I mean, how do they all heal? Nana sighed. Well, it's like I said, just on a larger scale. At some point, it needs to be talked about. I thought about the spirits in the barn, the horror on their faces. They'd fled something, something that had affected them all. I clenched my fists. I needed to talk to them. I was an anonsism, after all. Finding and carrying other people's stories was sort of my thing. Thanks, Nana, I said, scooting back from the table. My jaw sat with determination. That really helped. Of course, some of them dishes. Then find your grandfather and tell him he better come and help. Ain't no maids here. Nana raised an eyebrow and I grinned. Yes, ma'am. Grandmothers, they're the best. And that is... Tristan Strong destroys the world. That was track seven. That was uh, our second interlude. Um, track eight. Track eight. Whew. Track, track eight. How am I, you know what? I just gotta, I just gotta dive right into track eight because this is something that I feel like the world grapples with. I grapple with everyone grapples with. Track eight, how do we write beyond the perception of blackness? Um, I had to say this one for last. Um, the last, you know, uh, non-interlude track on this playlist, writing beyond the perception of blackness. Yes, indeed. Whose perception? Whose perception of blackness? Yours? Mine, ours, theirs. I'm talking about everyone's perception. The phrase goes, and I'm sure that you have all heard this at some point before. The phrase goes, we are not a monolith. Black is not a monolith. Meaning your black experience isn't mine and ours isn't what the, publish the publishing industry has traditionally paid to see. And we're not a monolith, baby. We are an iceberg. We are a collection of the freshest water, the potential for life, broken off and floating together across hostile seawaters where forces are constantly dragging us down. You think of icebergs as white, but did you know that they could be striped or a rainbow, a collection of colors, an amalgamation of sediment collected on our journey across the sea? 90% of ourselves cannot be seen. Our depths exist below the surface at levels we haven't even fully explored, but explore it we shall. That's what we're here for. We're writing about it. We will write about our blackness and it will be perceived. 
as one facet of many, as one tributary of a river, not the totality of an entire people. We will write about our pain and suffering, about our sadness and grief, about our trauma and rejection. We will also write about our love and desire, our beauty and grace, our joy and our peace. We will also write about none of that and it will be accepted because we're writing beyond what anyone thinks a black book should be, including ourselves. We will argue and debate and, and debate and criticize our work amongst ourselves because we are not a monolith, but we are readers and lovers of literature. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I have yet to meet two readers who agree on what the perfect book is. I just haven't met them yet. I haven't found them. From a distance, from a distance, blackness is perceived as a single, simple entity, a shadow, if you will. But that's just because those people who are looking from a distance, they just haven't been inside of blackness, baby. Their eyes haven't fully adjusted yet. Give it time, their perception will change. That's track eight. Track nine, our final interlude. And I thought it'd be appropriate appropriate to put it at the end when we think about beyond we think about beyond the now beyond the moment beyond what we have experienced and what is beyond beyond is the future how do we write the future and so the book the last gate of the emperor that i i co-wrote with prince joel mcconan is just about that it is about blackness in the future it is about um a young boy and his uh love love of video games but when he discovers a truth, a truth about himself and about the world around him, suddenly everything is changed. And I think that, um, I just wanna read it. I wanna read the opening to you to just give you one example of an infinite possibilities of what writing beyond and writing towards the future uh, could look like. So, chapter one of Last Gate of the Emperor. Once, there was an empire that stretched across the galaxy. Great, noble, wardens of peace and good fortune. They spread wealth and technology throughout the stars. This empire was called Axum. When Axumite ships landed in a new star system and made contact with the residents, they offered to teach them, to bring them into the empire, sharing their knowledge and power. That was how their empire continued to grow. All sentient races and species were invited, and though some did refuse, many accepted. But of those that accepted entry into the empire, there was one that grew jealous. These people coveted Axum's technology, for they came from a barren planet whose resources had been exhausted, and they longed to take to the stars to find new riches to exploit. But they didn't want to share. They wanted to rule. They were called the Wirari. The Warari bided their time, waiting until Aksum was distracted with the emperor and the empress's new baby, and then they struck. Using stolen Aksumite technology, they conquered one peaceful planet after another. Planets, space stations, asteroid colonies. The Warari enslaved them all, then continued across the galaxy like unstoppable conquerors. And to help, they unleashed a terrible monster, a creature of such hatred and violence, none could stand in its way. Its name was the Bolgu. But the emperor and the empress of Axum fought back. Their bodyguards were the, le were the legendary Machinatai, unparalleled warriors who wielded curved shotels wreathed in black, fame, black flame. The Machinatai were fierce. They fought like demons with incredible speed and power. The Axumite army, the living flames of the burning legion defended their nation until the bitter end. And it was a bitter end. Just when it looked like Axum would prevail, a traitor, someone known and loved by the royal family, robbed them of their source of strength, the power that let the mighty nation travel between the stars. Axum was trapped, and they and the Warari fell into a war of attrition. It was a stalemate. The battle stretched over months, even years, 
with no one really winning, but no clear loser. It is said that even today, the emperor and empress still fight together with their machinatai. They stand firm beneath the onslaught of the Bolgu, but without their source of strength, neither they nor the Warari could travel through space, and the two warring nations fell into darkness and out of history. And that's what shooting stars are, I said, looking out over the integrated virtual classroom. Whenever you see one in the night sky, it's the Machinatai and the Warari still battling high over our heads, granting you the power to reach for the sky. Thank you, Yared, came a voice from the corner. Which is why, I continued, I am asking for the authority net flight restrictions to be discontinued. How can we reach for the skies if our hands get zapped? Everyone deserves flying rights over the ridiculous 10 meter limit. There are hundreds of drones just waiting to harass kids like me. It is despicable. Yared, Mrs. Marjani warned. Seriously, who do they think they are? How are we supposed to make it to school on time if the streets are clogged in the mornings and a dutiful student can't fly a sky sail over them? Does the authority hate school? The lights in the class came on and I blinked twice. Mrs. Marjani, one of my favorite teachers actually, frowned at me as she walked to the front of the class. Even though it looked crowded, only 12 of the 75 students attending the lecture were physically present. It was the strangest thing and I'd only been at Addis Prime Primary for a month, so it took some getting used to. Well, let me take that back. The school itself was cool. Addis Prime Primary had been converted from an old factory overlooking a giant lake just inside New Oromia, the largest city on the space colony, Addis Prime. Massive conveyor belts ran through huge vaulted tunnels underground to the shopping district, and utility drones buzzed in and out throughout the day picking up supplies for the school. Do you know what that means? That means if someone was so inclined, they could hitch a ride on a floating metal bug the size of a cow and take it all the way to the largest collection of goods and delicacies this side of the galaxy, if they were so inclined. I would never do that, not during school hours, even if the most important game tournament in my life was taking place in that shopping district in less than an hour. No, that would be irresponsible. Rules, you know? At my old school on the other side of the colony, every student had to attend, no matter how far away they lived. Here, the majority of the students were virtual. They were represented by drones or, if their families could afford it, holographic displays. Sometimes even the teachers. Unfortunately, not Mrs. Marshani. She marched silently forward, passing through two small beetle-like drones, Haji and Kenef, who were wrestling in midair. She ignored them and stopped in front of me. Absolutely incredible, she said. Mrs. Barjani was a tall, short-haired woman from the highlands of Tigray Central. The light of the hollow projector with my presentation tinted her dark skin blue, giving her a magical aura. She was the most popular teacher at Addis Prime Primary. She was also the strictest. Thank you, I said, smiling. It is absolutely incredible that you decided to give a presentation with no historical basis or relevancy. I mean, honestly, Yared, did you even do the research? I asked you to present on the regional differences between New Aromia and Tigray Central, and you had a whole month. Instead, you, you, you come back with, with fairy tales. This is history, and I worked so hard on it. I sat with my Uncle Modi every night for a week pulling that story out of them. Do you know how many sambusas I had to fry? How many cups of tej I had to pour for him? My fingers are going to smell like oil and honey for a month. The class nigger. Mrs. Marjani pointed at my workstation. Sit, she said, squeezing the single word through gritted teeth. As I walked back to my seat, Haji's drone buzzed over and sat on my shoulder. Way to go, Yared, came a tiny voice. The drone speaker was barely audible. She looks like she's ready to explode. I thought you were going to give a presentation so good she'd let you go home early. The game starts in 45 minutes. If you're late, the admins will. I flicked the drone aside. He didn't need to tell me how important the upcoming game was. His number one ranking wasn't on the line. I know, I know, trust me, I've got this. Any second now. Mrs. Marjani was still lecturing me from the front of the class. And if you applied an ounce of effort to your studies instead of your ridiculous exploits, you might actually pass this class and others. But the story, I began to say, 
It's not true, Mrs. Marjani snapped. Was it just me or did she look angrier than I'd ever seen her? And nervous, but I couldn't linger on that too long. She was still lecturing me. And I am not putting up with your shenanigans today. Report to independent study. I expect a full revised presentation on the history of Addis Prime by tomorrow morning. Dismissed. The rest of you, screens out. Please load the holovid labeled 2109-A. Everyone groaned. A few people shot angry glares my way. I didn't meet their eyes. This was my fourth school in two years, and it looked like I'd spend my time here like I did at all the others. Alone. Independent study was a large room in the center of the school equipped with study pods so students could focus on exams or final projects. It was silent as a crypt, and the only door was monitored by secure drones that would alarm if they caught you trying to sneak out. However, the study hall also happened to be right next to one of the underground conveyor tunnels with multiple windows overlooking the entrance. I hid a smile as I gathered up my things. I may not have made any friends yet, but I was closer to fame and glory. This afternoon, when everyone found out who I really was, my name would be written in the stars. I winked at Haji's drone and walked out of class. I love this school. And that is from Last Gate of the Emperor. Uh, this book comes out in May, May 4th of this year. So I hope you will pre-order it and I hope you enjoy it as much as everyone has enjoyed uh, the Tristan Strong series. Um, so that was track nine. Track 10 is the outro. The outro is where uh, I thank you all. I thank um, not only the Black Ink Festival, I think not only um, the Friends of the Library, but I thank you viewers as um, Black writers, as Black readers, as people of a community that exists beyond, you know, my immediate neighbors and people I can go and see, but who exists just by the presence of what we're trying to do, which is to write our stories, to write stories that center us, that write stories about us, um, to write history, to write nonfiction, to write poetry, um, to write picture books, uh, um, graphic novels, to perform audiobooks, to center Black stories in the world of literature, um, whether or not uh, they've been fully appreciated now or in the past or into the future, you all are who I have to thank because you helped me become what I am. And um, we got to pass that on. We got to put the ladder down. We have to help others try and reach the, for the stars. You know what I mean? So thank you, everyone. Um, I was told, am I, am I on time? Look at that. I am right on time. Yes. I don't want to hear any jokes about the length of time that it took me to speak right on time. Um, so if, um, my fantastic moderator wants to hop back on, I don't know if we have any questions or not, any Q and A, if y'all want to just divide for a little bit, talk, chill, hang out. Uh, I'm here for you. So, as our wonderful keynote speaker has said, you have an opportunity to ask questions. So there is a chat box to the right of your screen. There's a segment that says Q&A. You can post your questions there. I will uh, read them to Mr. Rambalia and get his response. So um, we'll give you guys a moment. And also we'll, he will be available for a few minutes afterwards in our arena. He has a booth. So you can join him there in his very fancy booth. Um, so I do have a question um, about your, your conclusion. What can you tell us about the conclusion of the Tristan Strong series? Book three of the Tristan Strong series will be out this year. Um, the I know the title. I can't tell you the title. Um, I've also seen cover sketches. I can't share them with you. But I absolutely adore them. Um, and I just I just turned in um, uh, edits to uh, revisions to my editor. You know, so we might have you know copy edits come back and stuff like that. But as far as the story goes, it's kind of set now. And um, I just I I put a lot into it. Um, writing that book. Uh, during 
2020 was a lot. A lot happened, a lot unfolded, um, whether it was pandemic, whether it was um, the, the, the violence enacted against black people, um, a lot happened. And trying to write during that time, you know, as the whole point of my keynote says, I had to write beyond, right? I had to go beyond that moment, but I took some of it with me. And I believe I put some of it into that book you know, for um, for a long period of time before the book was officially announced, I just called it hashtag rage book because it is, um, it is a story about how, you know, wh- how do we, how do we interact with our anger, right? For, for a people, for a person, an individual who rightfully, rightfully um, is angry about something. How do we carry that with us? How do we mold it? How does it hinder or help us in our goals and our and our and our objectives? Right? How does it get in the way or make things easier for our us to achieve our accomplishments? Um, and that's a question that I, I think I had to ask myself, and that Tristan asked himself throughout book three. And so hopefully, um, when we come to the conclusion of it, that question will have at least been answered or we will have at least been pointed in a the proper direction to go to find those answers. Thank you. So one of our first questions from the audience is, tell us how you got started with your publisher, agent first or publisher first, and did you submit a full manuscript? Um, agent first, definitely agent first. Uh, and it was my, my, um, publishing my, my route to publishing is, is, uh, I feel like it's a series of fortunate events. Um, I, uh, when I think of, um, you know, I, my, where I, one of my, uh, I think it was like track one or two, we talked about community, right? And so I joined an actual online writing group and I, you know, um, we would submit writing and we would comment and critique and I got encouragement from them. They were like, Uh, Somebody said, hey, did you ever think about, you know, just publishing? You know, did you ever think about trying to write and actually write a book and get it published? And I said, no, I was just writing to write. You know, that's what I do. Writing is my hobby. Writing is how I express myself. Um, I never thought of, you know, selling it or whatever. And so um, I started submitting. I got rejected. I started submitting and submitting. I got rejected and rejected. Um, But as the saying goes, it only takes one yes. And so um, I got an agent and um, continue to submit writing. We continue to, to put work out there. And eventually we heard the call of um, Rick Riordan. You know, Rick Riordan was looking for African-American writers to write about um, uh, cultural uh, folklore and folk tales and mythology. And so I didn't submit a whole manuscript. I didn't submit the whole novel. I submitted three chapters and a synopsis of what the novel would be. And uh, the third and final chapter was, in fact, that gum baby scene that I read to you in the beginning. And they loved it. And that kind of, uh, you know, let the horse out of the barn there. And we've been running with it ever since. Great. And we do have someone who has raised his hand. I'm going to save him for last because that will pull his um, video feed in. So I have a couple more questions. Um, The other question, you hashtag wrote beyond. What was the... Okay, sorry. What was the developmental feedback like on your very original story? Um... Well, if we're talking about um, Tristan, if we're talking about Tristan drawing punches a hole in the sky, um, the feedback on that were, and I and I and I, I have to, I always tell this to young writers and, and young readers because sometimes these concepts exist in in contrast to them, and you can get great response and still have to fix things. Right. Like you can people can love your work and it's still and it's still not be perfect or it's still not be ready to actually be published. Right. Um, And that's a lot of times because uh, one of the jobs of an editor is to see beyond the the errors, to see beyond the part of the story that needs work and to grasp the story in its totality, to see its potential. Um, 
when we talk about gatekeepers and we talk about um, the obstacles presented in front of us as, as black writers, some of the times is that we feel, or it's been um, pretty evident that uh, editors have not been able to grasp that totality of the story um, within some of the black um, stories that have been written. And so um, for me, you know, I got feedback. It's like, hey, we need to, um, this is great. It's not ready, right? Like this is, it looks good. It's not ready, right? If you uh, make a pizza and it says put it in for 15 minutes and you take it out at seven because the cheese looks like it's bubbling, it's not cooked yet. It looks good. It looks great. You might be ready for it, ready to put it on the table, but it is not ready. Uh, and so that's for every book that I've turned in, it has never been perfect. And for every book that I will turn in, it will never be perfect. Um, there will always be something to correct, right? There will be always be something to fix. Nothing that we ever write and produce for the first time is perfect. That's what revisions are for. Okay, and then we have a question about how did you get connected with schools? Are they on recommended book lists for middle schools? So are your books on recommended book lists? I sincerely hope so. If not, how do I get them onto those book lists? Help me. Help me put them onto those lists. I want to give you my book. Please, I, let me give you my books. Put them on the list. Put them on the list. Um, but for, for me specifically, um, people reach out. Uh, I've gotten DMs. Um, officially, the best way to go uh, to do so is to go to my website. And I have a um, school visit page. And of course, everything is virtual now. Um, but you... Um, fill out that form on the page and it sends an email and we coordinate time and what you're looking for. Who am I speaking with? Is it a, uh, a keynote to a fantastic festival? Um, is it, am I speaking to middle schooler, you know, third grade? Am I speaking to high school? Um, and, uh, and, and we coordinate it that way. So, you know, I'm easy to reach. I'm always on Twitter. Uh, my website, you know, comes straight to me. Like there's, there, there's no, uh, you know, uh, middle manager. You know, I pretend like, hey, you know, this contact form is being rooted and will be, we will get back to you. It's me. It's me. I will get back to you when, you know, time permits and the baby allows me. Okay. We have two more questions and then we're going to wrap up. Um, this question is about you hitting the New York Times bestseller list. It starts with a congratulations. And then the question is, did you receive a lot of support from your publisher with marketing or did a lot of the work fall on you? Um, no, I, I received an absolute um, ton of support. I received a lot of um, marketing support. I received a lot of pub support, you know, pre and post launch. Um and it has been it has been fantastic because I know that it's not always the case. I know that that support is not always guaranteed, um, especially for marginalized writers. So I was very fortunate. Um, Disney and Rick Warren present specifically. They have you know they've had my back. You know if Tristan is a book you know that uses the analogy of boxing a lot, they have been in my corner from the very beginning. So we received a lot of support, and it's fantastic to know that 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 support. Uh, was received by you, right? Like all that support could be great, but it's the readers. You know, I'm very grateful for the support, but I'm even more grateful for the readers out there, the booksellers, the librarians, the teachers, the staff, media center specialists, um, and parents for getting it into the hands of children, book clubs. You all out there said, I want to read this book. You should read this book and you should read this book. Let's all read this book together because that is what put me onto the list. Awesome. And then the final question, what new adult literature have you enjoyed reading in this season? What, uh, what you said again, what adult? New adult literature. As in the new adult category or as in new literature for adults? That's a great question. Um, if Rhonda, can you, uh, in the chat, can you, or in the Q&A, can you clarify your question for us? Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to start thinking about adult literature. So she says new lit for adults. Gotcha. Okay. Oh God. And I should have, I should have had this. Um, oh, actually, you know what? I have it. Um, so 
Monday. No, uh, last week, January 5th, I think. So the first book release Tuesday of this new year of 2021, uh, this book came out called um, uh, The Prophets by uh, Robert Jones Jr. Um, so I've been reading that. I also devoured, devoured um, the, the Secret Lives of Church Ladies, um, which is a collection of, of short stories and is absolutely fantastic. It is... It is it is tiny. You can you can read this in a day, and then you will reread it that same day. It is really phenomenal. It is fantastic. You see, I've got my bookmark in there. Um, I think actually I was going to talk. Uh, I wanted to talk about one of the stories um, in here, but I just didn't you know ran out of time. I couldn't make it into the track list. Um, side note: When you're making a playlist for someone, you want it to be short and sweet and impactful. You don't want a 35 track playlist, okay? Because that means you just threw everything on there. Short, sweet, 10 to 15 songs, okay? Maybe a couple interludes if they're important. Short and sweet. Um, <laughs> so maybe you can talk about that one in the after. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And when you were, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off with your oh, last one. Yeah. I, I think just because it's appropriate because of what Monday is, is that um, I always read these every, um, every well, I got them last year, so for two years in a row now, by uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, the first is Why We Can't Wait, and the second is uh, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. So um, I am sick and tired of the same culprits parroting the same phrase that gets trotted out every time during MLK Day um, and where it's like, you know, this is, you know, he had a dream. This is what he believed. We should work together. And then the very next day, they go right back to tearing us apart. I believe that you should read the totality of what MLK actually had to say, and you will be astonished. Um, you will understand why at the period he was alive, he was vilified by a lot of people. Um, and you will understand a lot more why people selectively choose the quotes that they do. Because if they actually quoted some of the more you know, uh, other uh, less quoted portions of what King had to say, you know, they would be looking at themselves in the mirror and maybe they wouldn't like what they saw. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been so amazing. And as I sat here and listened to your 10 track playlist, um, I was very grateful that we are recording this because I'm going to need to go back and I look at it and digest it. And because you stepped on my toes a little bit, a lot bit, and in a great way. And so I'm really thankful for your time and your energy. And I just want to close us out by saying on behalf of the Black Ink Planning Committee, I would like to thank our keynote speaker, Kwame Mbalia, the panel speakers, the moderators, the attendees, and the team behind the scenes that made this all happen. We are so glad you all participated in our first ever virtual event, and we hope that you had a good time. We hope you learned a little something, and we hope you made some connections. And most importantly, we hope you discovered some new writers. So help us do our part in amplifying Black voices by sharing the videos from this conference. They are all available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Like, Hit your friends up. Tell them those who couldn't make it, they can still check us out. Sign up for our mailing list so that you can be in the loop with future Black Ink events. Um, and we just hope you'll join us in 2022 for the sixth Black Ink Charleston African American Book Festival. Have a great afternoon and stay safe turning off those computers later on. So if you're interested in joining Mr. Mbalia, he will be in the arena. You can find that on the left side of your screen and in his booth. He has his own booth. You can sit at his table and have a conversation with him. And so again, on behalf of Black Ink, we thank you and have a great day.